Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Today we are going to learn about a memories recipe. This is part two of the story of our Seder cement, or the Charesas. In our previous episode, we learned that there is a school of thought that tells us that the Charesa, it's not a mitzvah at all, it's a technical thing. It's dealing with some kind of poison, some kind of toxic substance that comes to us by dint of, by dint of eating this lettuce. And that was very perplexing, and we spent a lot of time last week figuring that out. And it's all good now. It's all good. But there's another school of thought. The other school of thought is that the charoset very much is a mitzvah. That's what... That's what the, the Mishnah says. This is a Mishnah that goes back to Daf Kuf Yud Dalad, the bottom of page 114. And over there, the Mishnah stated that in the, in, in, according to the first opinion, we bring the Charoises, Afopisha Ein Charoises Mitzvah. And then we hear the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer ben Sadak, who says, Mitzvah, it is a Mitzvah. All right. So the Gemara now would like to understand what does that mean when you say that it is a mitzvah? What kind of mitzvah is that? Where in the Torah does it say you shall eat charoset? I'll help you out. It doesn't. Anywhere. Okay, so if it doesn't say it in the Torah, how could it be a mitzvah? The answer would be, it could be a rabbinic mitzvah. That's obviously the case. Well, why would the rabbis make such a mitzvah? What is charoset anyway? In the first explanation, charoset is simply a guarantee that we don't get sick. It's a way to protect our health. So it's not a mitzvah. It's a, it's a technicality. It does not have any unique spiritual significance. But then we have Rabbi Eliezer ben Sadiq who says, no, no, no. It does. It has symbolism. It has significance. It's a mitzvah. So the Gemara in Daf Kuft, Kuft Hazai in page 116 now continues... And after having asked the question about the non-mitzvah approach, the Gemara cites Rabbi Lazar Bereb Tzadok Oimer Mitzvah. Rabbi Lazar Ben Tzadok says it is a mitzvah. So the Gemara says, My mitzvah. What kind of mitzvah is it? What does it even mean it's a mitzvah? And the Gemara says, Levi Oimer that the opinion of Rabbi Levi is Zecher Litapuach. It's important on the night of the Seder that there be something that brings to mind or helps us remember the apple. This is not to be confused with a different faith system's idea or conception of original sin, which they decided is an apple. It definitely, that was definitely not an apple. There's a whole bunch of, bunch, of, bunch of possibilities. Apples are not one of them. Huh? One is grapes, one is wheat, one is an esrog, one is a fig. So the Gemara is going to explain this. But that's what Rabbi Levi says. Haroset, apples. So it sounds like haroset should be chopped apples. Rabbi Yechenon, Rabbi Yechenon says, we're not remembering apples. Zecher letit. This is a memory of the clay, of the mud that we had to work with. Rashi tells us, Zecher letapuach, to remind us of an apple, Shahoyu yeldeis b'neihem sham. That's where they would give birth. The maternity ward in ancient Egypt was under the apple tree. I'll meet you under the apple tree meant, we're going to have a baby. And they gave birth there, miraculously, Beloy Eitzev, without any of the normative pain of childbirth. The normative pain of childbirth is told to Chava after the sin, the original sin that had nothing to do with the apple. So people, you know, it's a, it's a painful thing to have a baby. And because it's a painful thing to have a baby, baby's arrival usually means a big splash. And it's very hard to hide the baby's arrival. And if it's not, you're not going to be able to hide the baby's arrival, guess what happens when the Gestapo of the Pharaoh found, finds out you had a baby? They take the baby, they throw him in the Nile River. 
That's, that's what used to happen. So the people didn't want to give birth at home. So they would disappear. And they would go under some apple groves, some apple trees. And in the apple orchard, they would have these babies. This is the Gemara Mesech Saita and Afir Aleph. And Rashi says, yakiru so that the Egyptian taskmasters and the Gestapo who came to find the babies and kill them wasn't able to. They weren't able to. This is the meaning of what it says in Shir Hashirim in the 8th chapter. Tachat hatapuach I stimulated you under the apple tree, which has a variety of meanings. Amongst the meanings that the Jewish woman would give birth under an apple tree. And that was a very important part of the story of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim because we know that many, many Jewish people left Egypt. But how did those Jewish people uh, get born? Where did they all come from? Weren't they killing all the babies? And the answer is, they were having the children in the apple orchard. That's Levi's opinion. What about the mud? Zechel so the truth is that doesn't need any explanation. That's, uh, that's self-explanatory. We all know that they had to work with clay, with mud. And in the end, the Pharaoh wouldn't even give them any raw supplies. He said, go make your own bricks. Since you seem to have extra time in your hands and you want to talk about vacations. So we know that the making of, of clay bricks or the mud, that was a very important part of the Golos Mitzrayim, of the, the bitter enslavement of the... the terrible situation that we had. So that's the Zeich Rashbam Rashbam is, as usual, a little bit more explanatory. He says, Zeich Tapuach says Rashbam in Mesechet Sota. On, in the Mesechet Sota, on page 11, side B, Shohaya Yol Desham B'neim B'loi Eitzif. Same words as Rashi. They would have these babies without the normal child, the pain of childbirth. So that the Egyptians wouldn't know when they had a baby. And that's the meaning of the Pesach. So that's what Levi says. That's what we have to be remembering on the night of the Seder. And it's so important to remember what happened in Mitzrayim that we made a dish out of it. And it was brought to the Seder table. And it's a mitzvah. And I want to interrupt you before we go further and say we have these two ideas that it's a zecher letapuach, a memory of the apple or a memory of the mud. What is the mitzvah? What is the mitzvah? To remember. Is the mitzvah to remember it by virtue of seeing it? Is the mitzvah to bring it to the table? Is the mitzvah to dip the murrah inside it? Or is the mitzvah to eat the charoset? I don't know. It's not, so, it's not so pashat. It's not so simple. So, for example, when the Rambam talks about this, the Rambam says, HaCharoset mitzvah midivri sofrim. This is the Rambam in Hilchas Chometz Matzah, the seventh chapter, the eleventh halacha. He says it's a rabbinic mitzvah. Why zecher letit, a memory of the mud? We'll come back to that later. I want to take you to the end of the halacha. You bring it to the table on the night of Pesach. The Rambam does not say you eat it. He says you bring it to the table. Now the Rambam himself though, in Peter Shemeshnayis, tells us that the halacha is not like Rabbi Eliezer ben Sadiq. And he says, how do I know the halacha is not like Rabbi Eliezer ben Sadiq? So the Rambam says, in the Peter Shemeshnayis, that... If the halacha would be like Rabbi Lazar ben Tzaddik, he says, Chareises mitzvah, ladaita, in his opinion, chayev adam levarach, asher kedishanu b'mitzvah tav v'tzivanu al achilat charoset. But nobody's ever made a bracha like that. And because of that, so we say, ve'eni halacha, that's not a halacha. So it seems that when we say Rabbi Lazar ben Tzaddik held that it was a mitzvah, at least the Ramam understood, that that means Rabbi Lazar ben Tzaddik held that it's a mitzvah to eat charoset. So why don't we make a bracha? If it's a mitzvah to eat the haroset. The Ramah says, because the halacha is not like, like Rabbi Lezer ben, uh, ben Sadiq. However, others maintain the halacha is like Rabbi Lezer ben Sadiq. So why don't we make a bracha? Oh, we don't make a bracha because of a technicality. For example, if you look in 
Yes, we do. But don't we make a bracha on the maror? Asher kedishanu b'mitzvotav etzivanu al achilat maror. And why don't we make a ha'adama on the maror? Because we made a bracha on the karpas earlier. And because it's not considered an interruption. So the reason that it's not so simple is that when you have, when you have something which is not really there as part of a meal, but rather it's there as on its own accord, maybe it does have to have a bracha. Not so pashat, not so simple. So in the Avudar Ham, the Avudar Ham says like this, Hata'am she'ein mevarchen ala haroset, the reason we don't make a blessing on the haroset, and the Avudar Ham seems to believe that it is a mitzvah. He says, Afal pishi mitzvah ben divrei sofrim, even though it's a rabbinic mitzvah, mepnei she'ik tfeila lech karpas, because it is a secondary thing to the karpas, because the Avudar Ham holds you dip the karpas and the moror in the haroset. And he says it's only secondary. So we know that secondary things, it's called a davar tafel, you don't make a bracha. A simple example, you have milk in the morning with your cereal. People have Cheerios. It's a simple carbohydrate. It spikes their blood sugar and gives them energy for the day, or so they think. It's probably not very good for you. But anyway, people like to have milk in the, <laughs> cereal and milk in the morning. The milk has sugar in it. The, 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 the cereal has even more sugar in it. And it's very simple. It goes right into your bloodstream. You make a bracha on the milk, you make a bracha on the Cheerios. Why? You're eating a bowl of milk. Will you eat Cheerios without milk? <laughs> Nobody sits down in the morning, I'm having my bowl of Cheerios. Oh, there's no milk. So the answer is, because I'm eating Cheerios with the milk. Milk is the tafel, it is secondary. So that's what the Avud Aham says, the same kind of thing over here. He says this is a, the concept of, 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 the, of the haroset because it's only a dip. So that's why it's a secondary thing. That's why you don't make a bracha on it. And certainly you're asking a bracha, making a, a, a bracha, a mitzvah bracha for sure we would make on it. Forget about what bracha you make on haroset. That would be a good question. Because it's nishtan etzeros legreyosa. It doesn't look like an apple. Nobody knows what it looks like actually. It's a hodgepodge of stuff. And that's really what the Aruch says. That's what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like cement. <laughs> supposed to look like mud. Seder cement. It's not supposed to look appetizing. Maybe it's supposed to be appetizing, but not supposed to look appetizing. So nobody's questioning what bracha you make as birchas hanenin, but the question is, do you make a bracha of the bracha of Asher Kedishanu b'mitzvah Tavet Sivanu al achilat haroset? Yes, but there's no such mitzvah in the Torah. And there's no such mitzvah in the Torah to kindle a menorah on Hanukkah. And there's no such mitzvah in the Torah to listen to a Megillah on Purim. There are a lot of things that we do. There's no such mitzvah in the Torah. We should wash our hands for the Tila Tadayim. It's a rabbinic mitzvah. And we make a bracha on rabbinic mitzvah. It's also a subject for another day. All I'm pointing out to you is it's not so simple. It's not so simple. I looked in the translations. So um, the, in the, in the Masifta Gemara, they actually contradict themselves. Because the Masifta Gemara, in the Mishnah, in the, Mish, in, the, in the commentary in the Mishnah, they say that the mitzvah is to eat it. And then here in the, in the commentary in the Gemara, they say the mitzvah is to dip it. So either they have two authors, or the author was maybe it was Purim when he was writing it, and he forgot what he wrote two pages ago. Because, uh, so the Masifta Gemara contradicts itself. The Art Scroll translates it as as uh, dipping, and the Steinsaltz edition translates it as eating. Well, what's the answer? The answer is, could be any, all of the above. <laughs> it's not, it's not Poshet. It's not, I don't know what the mitzvah is. I, I would say to you that on a very, very straightforward level, the Mepharshim don't speak about this, by the way, but on a very straightforward level, if you look at the Mishnah on Daf Kuf Yodala, the Mishnah on page 114, what is the Mishnah talking about? What's the verb in the Mishnah? Hey, viu. Hey, viu. It says you bring it. It doesn't say you eat it. It says you bring it. And that's the only time we hear about the Charosa, when you bring it. So the bringing it, I, mean, I, I, I think maybe on a straightforward level, the mitzvah would be to bring it. Why is it a mitzvah to bring it? Ah, for this, you have to stay tuned because, <laughs> well, come back to that. There's a, there's a very big deal in bringing it, or more accurately, for it being on the table. It has to be on the table. In other words, it's a part of our storytelling. This is the visual aid. You taste it, you see it, you look at it, you smell it, you use it. It makes the story more interesting. And that's what this is about, conveying the story in an interesting and a fascinating way to the next generation to keep their attention. So we have these two opinions. These two opinions. We have Rabbi Levi. Rabbi Levi is telling us that it's a tapuach. It's about an apple. It's about the story of the Jewish birth rate. And we have Rabbi Yochanan who's telling us it's the story of the Jewish suffering, the story of the slavery, the story of the bondage, the story of the forced efforts and work. Okay. So uh, what's the halacha? What do we do? Here it gets very interesting. 
Before telling us what the halacha is, or how, who we follow, because it's two very different schools of thought, Amr Abaya, Abaya says, Hilkach, therefore, Tzarech Likiyuhi, therefore it needs to be tart. It needs to have an acidic taste to it. A sharp, acidic taste to it. And Vitzarech Lisimuche, it has to be thick in its consistency. It can't be like, like, like a liquid. It has to be like a paste. It has to be like a paste. So what is Abaya saying? What does that mean? Hilkach. Because we have, we have opinion of Levi. It's about the apples. We have an opinion of Rabbi Yochanan. It's about the mud. So Abaya says, aha. And that's why it should be tart. And that's why it should be thick. What? What does that even mean? So, Rashi and Rashbam tell us the following. Tzorech liki yuhi. It has to be tart. It needs to be acidic. Why? Says Rashi, zecher letapuach. Because this reminds us of the apple. You may not have noticed it, but apples have a certain tartness to them. And if you leave apples, they easily ferment. And they become sharp. A sharpness to an apple. Now, I know green apples are like that, but I guess even sweet apples, they're a certain edge to the apple. So therefore, you have to have, you have to have a kiwi to remember the, the apple. Vitzorech lisimuche, and you have to make it thick in its consistency, and that is zechelatit. That reminds us of the mud. In other words, Rashi interprets the teaching of Abaye that Abaya says, because we have a school of thought that has to remind us of the birth rate. That's the apple. Because we have a school of thought that has to remind us of the suffering and the backbreaking work. That's the mud. So it has to look like mud, meaning it has to be thick like mud, and it has to be tart like apples. In other words, according to Abaye, we're covering two bases. We're following the school of thought of Levi, and we're following the school of thought of Rabbi Yochanan. You look in the Rashbam, Rashbam develops this as usual in a little bit of a more elaborate way, and he says, what I just, what I, I just quoted Rashi to you. Rashbam says that what is the meaning of Lissimuche? He says, Lissimuche, how do you make it thick? He says, I'll tell you how. Lichtesh bay You've got to chop up a lot of different vegetables. Harbe. Kadeshi yo'ove. You have a lot of different vegetables, and they're not all going to... It makes like, a, like a, a dough of sorts. It all congeals and comes together. Now he goes back to explain why do you need... Firstly, he says, how do you even make it thick? How do you make something which is chopped up and thin? You, if it's pureed, how do you make it thick? He says, put a lot of chunks in it. It's a salsa. Make it chunky. Then Rashbam says... So what's the meaning of tzarech likiyua? Lahatil boy tapuchin. Make sure that one of the ingredients is apples. One of the ingredients has to be apples. Why? Is bekiyua because apples are tart. And why is that important? Zecher letapuach. We should remember the apples. And then he says v'tzarech lesimuche. You have to make it thick, because that is a zecher, a memory of the tit of the mud. So from the way we hear the explanation of Rashi and Rashbam, the way they seem to be learning the Pshat, we're covering our bases here. Which is very strange. Because immediately after the words of Abaye, the Gemara brings this to some kind of resolution. The Gemara says, Tanya Kavosei the Rabbi Yechanan. We learned a teaching which lines up perfectly with the opinion or school of thought articulated by Rabbi Yochanan. No, I want to point out to you. Rabbi Yochanan is a sage of the Gemara, not of the Mishnah. We call that, in yeshiva language, he was an Amoira, not a Tana. Amoroim don't argue with Tanoim. If it's in a Mishnah, it's a teaching of a Tana. If it's in a Brita, which is the codicil of the Mishnah, it's a teaching of a Tana. If you were an Amora and you had a tradition, and you wanted to bring proof 
that your traditional teaching was accurate, what's the best thing you could hope for? A Mishnah that backs you up. Or if not a Mishnah, at least a Brisa. And the Gemara says, indeed, indeed, we have a Brisa. We learned like Rabbi Echanan. What is the Brisa? The Brisa says, Tavlin, Zecher, Letevin. The spices that are mixed into the Haroset, they remind us of the straw, because they used to make bricks with straw. Haroset, that's the actual mixture, is a Zecher Letit. That's a remembrance of the mud that they baked, with, they, made it, they, ba- they baked as bricks. We'll soon talk about the straw. That there was in the bricks they put straw. We hear that in the Torah. He says, the brisa says that that you have, you have the tavlin, that the, the spices that were used. It's referring to the spices that were used were like like um, like rosemary and stuff like, that. like we didn't hear. We're going to hear about cinnamon and hear about um, and hear about ginger. Okay. That shouldn't be broken up too small. I'll soon share with you what some of the Rishonim said yeah, about. Right. So if you, the apple gets soft, but then we want to have it spiked. You want to have not just soft puree, we want to have a little bit of something else that creates a different consistency. That's, that's straw-like. So for the brysa, it's very clear, if we're making it straw-like, that why are we making, why are we making the charoset like this? What are we trying to recall? What are we trying to remember? What's this a recipe for? Memory, memory of the bricks. Now, this is very strange because Abaya just said we have to follow two schools of thought, but the Gemara comes and rules that we follow the school of thought of Rabbi Yochanan, that it's about remembering the, remembering the mud. And the Gemara finishes off like this. The Gemara says, Omer Rabbi Lazar Bet Tzadik, Rabbi Lazar Bet Tzadik taught, Ka chayo emrim tagrei charach shabir shalayim. This is what the food sellers, the sellers of the spices were saying in Yerushalayim on Erev Pesach. They were saying, Boyu utlu lechem tavlin le mitzvah. Come and purchase your spices for the mitzvah. Now, as our sages tell us, Rabbi Lazar ben Sadiq was alive in the time of the second base of Megdash. And what is a harach? So I'll, I'll take you to the words of the Me'iri. The Me'iri translates this, synopsizes this whole thing very nicely in his beautiful compilation, Beis Abachira. The Me'iri says that in our Gemara, we are now trying to understand the business of how charoset could be a mitzvah. And he says, clearly, you can see nechliku. There's a, dispu- there's a dispute. That there is a school of thought that says, zecher letapuach, that it reminds us of the apple, and that's the story of the Jewish birth rate. And because of that, tzarech lekiyua. That's why you have to have the tartness. So Meiri seems to be saying just like Rashi. And then he says... You have to put inside it also not only things of kiyua, but you also have to make it thick. Lismuche. Why? That is la to thicken the consistency, to non liquefy it, to congeal it. And that's a zechelatit. That reminds us of the mud. And then he says, Opirshu ha geonim, the geonim said, Notenin letocho tavlin. They placed spices into this mixture. And why did they do it? Zecher leteven. Because the bricks were not only made of clay or mud, they were also made of straw. So the straw hay that was mixed in, so he says, kegoin knomoin vizangvo, like cinnamon or ginger, which are daimen leteven. It looked like straw. It was to chop it up that way. V'kach hoyer tagre charoch, this is what the Tagre Charoch of Yerushalayim would say, and he quotes Rabbi Lazar ben Sadiq, and he says, what is a tag, Tagre Charoch? What is a Charoch? What does it mean? And he says two very interesting things. He says, we have a Pasuk that says that Mashiach, in the end of time, is going to be peering through the cracks. And that's called, it says, Meitzitz mina Charakim. He's peering through the cracks. Small holes. So he says, what, what happened is, on Erev Yom Tov, you're not really supposed to have the stores open because it's Erev Yom Tov. And Erev Pesach is like Yom Tov. But people needed the spices. So what'd they do? They had like a, you know, the, the, the canteen where people like open a window and they put down a little table. So they had to open these windows in the, in the shops. The shop wasn't open. But they had like a little window open. And you could purchase things through the window. So the canteen was still open. And in the canteen, you were buying things like spices. 
And that's why it's called Chalach. This was a rare kind of sale. It wasn't a normative day in business. And the only reason that they were allowed to be open was because last-minute shoppers. They needed to make sure they would have charoset for Pesach. Charach means, charach, it means like a hole, a crack. And then he says, the Meiri says there's another opinion, that it's not charach but hadach. It's not a ches but it's a hay. And what is hadach? He says hadach means chopped up because you have to chop up, it was like a, from the word maducha. You have to like a, like, a, like, a, like a mortar. You have to chop up, finely grind and chop the spices. So the Meiri basically ratifies for us the Rashi, the Rashbam, this approach that we have two separate schools of thought. Okay, there you have it. The reason that you have to have the charosa should be tart, following the school of thought of Levi, remembering the birth rate, the reason that it has to be mud, this follows the school of thought of Rabbi Yochanan, that it has to be like the clay remembers the minds of the clay. So very interestingly, when we take a look in the alphas, in the riff, when the riff repeats this Gemara, the riff does not have the same version as our Gemara. Very different version of the Gemara. The riff says like this. I guess my sticky fell out. I have to look for this. Okay, here we are. So the riff says, my mitzvah, what's the mitzvah? And he, he, leaves, he leaves out Levi's name. He says, Zechel Then he says, Rabbi Yochanan says, Zechel then the riff says, listen carefully to me. Amar Abaya, Hilkoch, because Rabbi Yechonon says, that's why we need to have kiyua, we need to have a tart. And we learned like Rabbi Yechonon, that the tavlin is zecher l'teven. It reminds us of the straw, and he talks about the ginger, and he talks about the, uh, the um, no, cinnamon, and he, and he brings down that the Tagar Yerushalayim were selling the spices of mitzvah. Now, Rabbeinu Nisim, who is a commentary on the riff, he says, Tzarech Likiyua. He doesn't explain that you have to remember an apple. He says, Kiyua is tartness. What is tartness? He says, Kigoin. For example, Tapuchim Chamutzim. Green apples, sharp apples, or chaymets, or vinegar. It doesn't speak about the, the remembering a tapuach. Huh? He's, he doesn't say the word a remembrance of the apples. He says it has to be tart. Yes, zacher is remembrance, but he doesn't mention the word zacher. The Ram doesn't mention the word zacher. Why doesn't he mention the word zacher? Because when you read the alphas, the riff, in the Rif's Gemara, he doesn't say Abaya is following two schools of thought. In the Rif's version, Abaya rules like Rabbi Yechanan, which, by the way, makes a lot of sense. So why is there a need for tartness? The Gemara doesn't talk about it. The Rif doesn't explain that. When you look in Rabbeinu Asher, the Rosh, and I want to just point out for those of you with this uh, station identification, that when we, we talk about the Halacha, the forerunners of Halacha, so... The Talmud was restated in three different ways. The, the Rif took out the arguments and sometimes the names, and he shortened the Talmud and he stated the Talmud only in halachic prose without the give and take. That was the first codification written. It's written as a replication of the Talmud. It follows the Talmud, the order of the Talmud. Then we have Rabbeinu Asher, who lives almost two centuries later. And he writes halachas, it's called halachas, halachas, he writes in the back of the Gemara, also according to the Mesichtot. And then we have the Rambam, who created a whole new system and reclassified the old Torah in halachic prose. These are called the three pillars of halacha. All halacha is developed by looking at the major amudi halacha, the amudi hira, which is rif, rosh, and Rambam. So we look in the rif, the rif tells us that Abaya says it has to be tart and has nothing to do with remembering the Jewish birth rate. But look in the Rosh. The Rosh tells us that the, these uh, two opinions over here, Levi's opinion, Rabbi Yechina's opinion, Abaya said, Hilkach mitzvah u mitzvah In the Rosh's version, he switches the order. 
He doesn't first talk about tartness and then talk about the thickness or consistency. He starts off with the consistency and he says, and it has to be tart. And then he says, we learned like Rabbi Echelon, that that's what the, that's what the, 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 the Brysa says. And he says then, and he finishes off with the following statement. Charoset zecher letit. Charoset is about remembering the clay, the mud. Full stop. That's it. He doesn't mention remembering the birth rate. And he says, he brings down, Rabbi Lazarus Tzaddik remembers this. They were selling the spices. So the Rif doesn't talk about the birth rate. The Rosh doesn't talk about remembering the apple or the birth rate. Let's go back to the Rambam. When the Rambam in the laws of Chometz and Matzah, chapter 7, verse 11, tells us that it's a mitzvah, he says that the mitzvah of Divri Sofrim, why? Zecher Letit. It reminds us of the clay, the mud, that's all he says. Because they shall yaiv them, baby mitzrayim. That's how they were working. And then he tells us how we do it. He says, how do you do it? Oh, you bring uh, dates, and you bring figs, and you bring raisins, and you chop them up, and you mix them up, and uh, you spice them, so it should look like hay, look like straw, and you bring it to the table. So the three poskim, the three amudei ra, which are the three what all halach is based on, Alphys, Rosh, and Rambam, all three of them clearly view the words of Abaye not as a cause of following the opinion of Levi, but it's all connected to the opinion of Rabbi Yochanan. That's what charosis is. Somebody asks you, what's charosis? By the way, if you ask most children, what's charosis? They know. The bricks. The cement. Something very interesting happens a generation later. We have now, we have Rabbeinu Yaakov Balhaturim, the son of the Rosh, writes the forerunner of the modern day Shulchan Aruch. It's called the Arba Turim. It doesn't follow the order of the Talmud. It doesn't incorporate the entire Torah like the Rambam. It takes Jewish life and it breaks it into four pillars, four rows. There's the row of Orachayim, daily life. Things like how you wake up in the morning, when you pray, mitzvahs like putting on tefillin, affixing a mezuzah, keeping the Shabbat, observing the festivals. That's Orachayim, that's daily life. And then he has others, other rows. There's the row of Ebenezer, that's marriage, chas v'shalom, divorce, ideas of matrimony, family life. Yoradea, things which are permitted and not permitted, like kosher food and non-kosher food. And then a new, another pillar of life, which is the, the, the Jewish judiciary. Anything which is not connected to the way we are living our lives today doesn't show up in the Shulchan Aruch or in the Tur. For that, you have to look in the Rambam, look in, in the Alphas. That's not, that's why? Because it's not relevant in our day and age. When Mashiach will come, Mashiach won't need the Shulchan Aruch. Mashiach will know what to do. So in Simon Tof Ayin Gimel, which is chapter 473 of Orachayim, of the laws of Pesach, the Tur says the following. For those who want to look inside, maybe watch online or want to look in later, it's in subsection 5. The Tur says, and I'm quoting, V'hacharoset hu zecher letit. Fact. The charoset is a memory of the clay. The clay. What were we doing in the land of Egypt? What was our major slavery vocation? The answer is building. And to build, what do you need? Building material. Nobody was using steel those days. Mitzrayim doesn't have stone. There were no quarries. There was no stone. So you made the bricks. They made bricks. Lakach, therefore, tzarich la'asoto av. Therefore, you have to make it thick. Like cement. Like clay. Zechelatit. Umidvarim chamutsim, and it has to be tart or acidic. Zecher lemaror. To remember the bitterness. It was a bitter time. It wasn't an enjoyable activity. Construction work is very happy people. 
they got a job, you tell them what to do, they're happy people. They're not bitter. The slaves are bitter. It's a bitter life. So the Torah clearly says here, number one, he says, this is Zechel Number two, he says, it's tart. So it's Zechel it has to be thick. And it's tart. He seems to be following very much the system of his father, of the Rosh. The Rosh first put the thick, and then he put the tart. He uses that order. The author of the Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosef Karo, the Bet Yosef, wrote a commentary called Bet Yosef. That was his first. First he wrote a commentary in the tour, then he wrote the Shulchan Aruch. So he says, I'm very, very disturbed by what it says over here in the tour. He says, I don't know what's going on over here. He says that it's a Zecher Lemaro, he says. Who ever heard of such a thing? Where in the Gemara does it say that the bitterness of slavery it should be commemorated with Seder cement? That's what we have the bitter herbs for. It's what we have the, the Roman lettuce for. I never heard of such a thing, he says. And therefore, he says, after a lot of thought and contemplation, I've come to the conclusion this is a mistake, and a copyist mistake. It's not what he wrote. It's a Torah Sefer. And he says, what he meant, or probably originally wrote was, not Zecher Lemoror, but Zecher Litapuach. And somebody came along and copied it. And he said, aha, uh-huh, Moror, Tapuach. How could it be a Tapuach? What does an apple have to do with Pesach? It must be a Moror. It's a very shocking thing that Bishosa says because there are many, many copies of the manuscript and later this is in print. And the Bishosa says it's a printing mistake. A copyist mistake. Everybody made the same mistake. It's a very strange thing what he says. But that's what he says. He says the whole, it's, it's, it's got to be a mistake over here, the Bishosa says. There's a Torah Sefer B'lash Rabbeinu. You have to have instead Chamutzim Zechel Tapuach. And he says, and this is the idea of remembering the, uh, what happened uh, under those trees, how people were born. And he says, maybe this is Zechel Amorah also. Oh, Zechel Amorah, the bitterness too. But the main thing is the apple, the apple in the, the apple orchard. And he says, this is, you can see this clearly, that Abaya wants to follow both schools of thought. So the Torah is saying like Abaya. But then the Torah would seem to be arguing with his father. Which could, I mean, could be. Rabbeinu Yoel Sirkish, who wrote a later commentary on the Torah called the Bayit Chadash, the Bach. The Bach says, the Beit Yosef claims that there is a mistake here. And he says, I am astounded. I don't know what to tell you. In that case, all the printing mistakes, everybody got it wrong. Everybody copied. Everybody got the word tapuach, mor instead of tapuach. He says, this is entirely unrealistic. Lakach nidali, therefore, I believe that Rabbeinu, meaning the, ba- the Balaturim, the Tur, follows the version of the Rif, who says the halachas like Rabbi Yochanan, and the Rosh, and it's also the Rambam. And he says they all say the halachas like Rabbi Yochanan. Zechelatit. So he says, so why does it have to be tart? So he's explaining it has to be tart because. The Shibud, because the, the slavery was very, very difficult and challenging and painful. And as such, the Rif and the Rashi says, are telling us that it has to be, in addition to being in mindful or remembering the consistency of mother clay, we also have to remember the concept of the bitterness of their work. This is what the, this is what the Bach says on the tour. And he says that... This is Zecher Lemoror. He translates it, Shahayu Shinehem Kehos. The teeth were set on edge. You know when you eat something which is very tart, very acidic, and like, that's how they felt. That's how they felt. They were like, Ay, this is terrible. So that's what we're making it tart. It's like sweet and sour. There's a sour edge to it. And that's how the Bach explains the tour. It makes perfect sense. That's the Zechel Amorah. Just by the way, when you go to the Shulchan Aruch, which is authored by Rabbi Yosef Karo, he says nothing. He says you bring charosas. He doesn't tell you how you make the charosas. He doesn't tell you what you do with the charosas. Zero, zilch, not a nothing. 
doesn't tell you tart, not tart, doesn't, doesn't give you instructions. He figures, you'll, however your mother made karosot, that's how you make karosot. <laughs> you have to look at Shokhan Aruch. <laughs> this is a tradition. We do it year after year. Figure it out. So, so but, we, but the, Ramah, the Ramah does talk about the, the, the Kharosat. But before we do that, I want to take you back to the original Gemara. And I want to share with you something very interesting that the Tosfos says, the commentary of the Tosfos. So if we go back to the Gemara, you should have it. If you, can, if you want to look at it, you'll see it on the side of your page. It's on the, the Tosfos is the, the second Tosfos on the page. That's the out, outside of the page in the Rashi script. The Tzarech says, the, the, the Gemara says, Tzarech l'simuche v'tzarech l'kiyue. We have to have it both thick and tart. And very interestingly, the Tzarech order is also reversed from our Gemara. First thick and then tart. So the Tzarech says, you know, that in the Talmud Yerushalmi, there's another element of the Charosas that gets introduced, which we haven't talked about at all. It doesn't show up in the Bavli. And that is... The of the zecher ledam. According to the Talmud Yerushalmi, the charoset reminds us of the blood. And he says that's why we call it a dip, because it's liquidy, because it's got wine, and the wine reminds us of the blood. Unfortunately, this is where our enemies took these uh, blood libel stories from, because we had symbolism of blood, not chas blood. What does the Yerushalmi say? The Yerushalmi is found in Perek Arve Psachim. And the Yerushalmi there goes like this. And you'll soon see how the Yerushalmi kind of vacillates between the thick and the, the watery, the liquid. The liquid and the solid. The Yerushalmi says like this. It's the end of Halacha Gimel. The Yerushalmi says, we have a, a dispute in the Mishnah, of whether there is a mitzvah to dip the mara in the haroset. So here, we are going to cite the opinion of, that supports, the, uh, or a support for the opinion that it's a mitzvah. And in Yushalmi, it's a little bit different. The Yushalmi's tradition is, we go straight to the merchants of Jerusalem, straight to the marketplaces of Jerusalem. Yigumara says, Tagad Yushalayim Hayyayimnim, the merchants of Yerushalayim would say, tavli mitzvah. Come and take for yourself the spices for the mitzvah. What's the spices for the mitzvah? It's the mitzvah of Charoset. Okay. Now the Gemara tells us, B'nei b'sayu the Isi, b'shem Isi, the members of the household of Isi said in his name, V'loma nikra shmo roiva. Why is it called roiva? And they said, because it fights with the mara that's dipped into it. What is that supposed to mean that it fights with the mara that's dipped into it? In other words, that, uh, that it's, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't stick together. They're two separate substances. You stick it in, it doesn't put something in liquid. You know, it goes right in. This, Rabbi Shur ben Levi said, yeah, exactly. It has to be thick. And the Gemara says, Mil say Amra, from the teaching of Rab Levi, Yeshua ben Levi, we know that it is a zecher latit. We know it must be a remembrance of the clay. Then the Yerushalmi says an opposing view. Is Tanoi Tani, there is another teacher of the Brai so taught. Tzarech Shetehei Raka. It has to be liquidy, it has to be thin. Why? Why? Because that commemorates zecher ladom. It commemorates the idea of the blood. And what are we talking about here? The Pashtas, this refers to the first of the plagues. The first of Aseret, the Aseret HaMakot, which was when the Nile River turned to blood. So we're commemorating the concept of the slavery, and we're also commemorating the beginning of the miraculous deliverance. So here we have now another idea, a whole new idea. Till now, the question was tart or thick, or both. Now we have another idea that tells us that it should also be liquidy. It's got to have wine in it too. So how are we going to do all this? So the Teisvah says like this. That's why it's called, That's why it's called, 
we call the maror dipped in liquid because it is liquidy. V'chein ama de bar. So the face says, and if you look at what, what, what do people do? What people do is this. In the beginning, it's simuchi. In the beginning, it's thick. Right before you dip the mortar, and what do you do? You liquefy it. You add a bunch of wine. And here the Teisvis mentions the tartness. He says, you make it watery. You make it liquid. How? You make it, you thin it. You thin it with wine and vinegar. So there's a tart taste to it, and that fulfills the mitzvah of the Yerushalmi also. This, by the way, seems not to have to do with bringing the haroset or having the haroset at the table, which we mentioned at the beginning of tonight's class, but using the haroset. And the Teisva says, incidentally, in the Rebbe Zagada, it says that he saw what his father did, that uh, he would have the, the most uh, Kiddush cups have like a little bit of a little, a little silver tray underneath. So the wine, you spill over the wine, the wine spills over. So the wine's in the tray. He would take the haroset, put it in the tray. And he would dab it lightly, and that would thin the haroset. And then you could dip the murr into the wet haroset. Then the Teisva says, Uvetshuvah sagoinim, in the responsa of the geonim, which is the period after the Gemara and its close, which is called Rabban and Savroi, after that's the period of the geonim. So in the response of the geonim, it says we should make the haroset of peirot shenidma lekneset Yisrael of fruits that the Jewish people are metaphorized as. We're a fruity people. Why? Because there are a number of different fruits that we are described as in the book of Shir Hashirim. What are those fruits? In Shir Hashirim, it says, first of all, we're compared to an apple. That's the apple business. Then it says, like the branch of the rimon, that's the pomegranate. Then we get the business of a fig, a te'ena, like a budding to a fig. Then we hear about the idea of an egos, a nut garden. And then we hear about shkedim, about almonds. And the almonds is just shaka da kodesh baruch ola because Hashem was very diligent to bring us to redemption. So basically, what's your re- memory's recipe according to the Gaonim? Apples, pomegranates, Pomegranate seeds, figs, nuts, and almonds. They don't mention anything about the, the hay or the other stuff. Okay? So that's, that's, that's what, that's, that's what the, the Teisvah says. When we take a look in the Shulchan Aruch, so the Shulchan Aruch itself mentions nothing about how you make the, the Haroset. But the Ramah, who is Rabbeinu Moshe Isilis, who this is the, the author of the Ashkenazic Shulchan Aruch, who, after the Bet Yosef printed his book, he said, why should I write a second book? Then we have two Shulchan Aruchs. I'll just put a, a tablecloth under the table. So he wrote glosses, and they're printed after the words of the Mechaber, uh, printed the words of the Ramah. So the Ramah says, here's my note, gloss. The gloss is that when it comes to the Haroset, the Haroset Yase of the haroset should be made thick. Why? Zecher letit. We should be remembering the mud, the clay. Then after, mix in a little bit of vinegar or wine. So he is talking about the concept of he mixes the tartness in there. And he says, wine, zecher ladam. He's clearly quoting the Yerushalmi as is quoted by the Taisus. And he says, and you make the haroset of peirot shenim shalu behem Yisrael, of the fruits that the Jewish people are metaphorized as. And then he goes ahead and he lists the same fruits we just heard in the Tosfos. He says, tapuchim, apples, te'enim, fi, uh, figs, egoizim, nuts, rimonim, pomegranates, switches the order a little, and shkedim, and almonds. And then he says, you should also put spices in it, like kenoma mezangvel, like cinnamon, and like ginger, which are doimim, the tevin, because they're like, they remind us of hay, straw. And that's why, that's how you strengthen the consistency when it gets baked in the, in the sun, but it has like straw going through it, so that's what becomes the, the, uh, what holds it together, holds the brick together. Now, the Ramah's words are actually found 
in the, in the Hagos of the Maharil. Maharil is a few generations before the Ramah, whose works are seen as the foundation of what we call Ashkenazic Minig and Halacha. Rabbi Yaakov Mulin was the leader of Ashkenazic Jewry in the 12th century. And he writes straight up, Charoset Zecher Letit. Straight. Zecher Letit. And we have, we should also put Kida in Kenomen. You should also put uh, cinnamon. And we should also put ginger. And he says, Mechutochem Aruchem. Cut them in long pieces. Don't chop them up in little pieces. Why? Because that'll be a Zecher Letevin. And then it says, V'amar Mari Segel. He also said, Yesh Poskim, there are those who rule. Lasses Rimonim, that people should add pomegranates. And he says, that's Kedele Kiyui, to make it tart. Because I guess pomegranate juice can ferment. So he talks about tartness. Nothing about apples. And it's clear that Maharil rules that this is all about Zechel So, Rashi and Rashbam and Meiri are telling us about the Tapuach. However, we look in all the sources of Shulchan Aruch and we don't have any mention of this at all. The Bach says that the words of the Bet Yosef are unreasonable because the Gemara says two schools of thought and then the Gemara brings proof that Allah is like, is like uh, Rabbi Yochanan. But there's something very interesting that I found. Very interesting. The Rosh, when he finishes writing all his halachas, he wrote what we call a kitzer. He wrote just a short synopsis of halacha. A synopsis, like a kitzer shochan aruch. And in the synopsis, the Rosh says that you have haroset, and the haroset serves as a memory for the tit. And he mentions the tapuach also. Very unusual. I didn't highlight this. I have to find it. I didn't. I'm, I'm, I'm showing you how we don't seem to follow the business of, of, the, of, the, of the apples at all. All the halacha, we read our Gemara. If we learn our Gemara right, you don't seem to talk about the apples at all. However, however, it's not so simple. It's not so simple. Where is this? Kuflamet, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Kuflamet, here Oh, here it is. So this is what the Rosh says in his Halacha Hilchot Pesach Biktzara. He says like this. He says, even though lo huska haroset, we don't hear, the, we hear of the haroset until they bring the moror. He says the haroset is a zecher letapuach o zecher letit. Be strange. He mentions now the apple. He says it could be a zecher letapuach or a zecher letit. And that's in the synopsis. So he brings down the business of the apple. And he says, the bottom line is that the, um, the haroset serves a number of different memory purposes. But this is very, very unusual. And I noticed something fascinating in the Alter Rebbe's Shulchan Aruch. The Alter Rebbe what they call the world calls the Shochan Aruch Harav. The Alter Rebbe says in Simen Tofa in Gimel, in chapter 473, so in Sif Chof it says like this. He talks about the Haroset, and he says, V'tiknu, our sages ordained, She'yihiyu lefanov Haroset. The Haroset should be on the table. He doesn't say about eating the Haroset. He doesn't talk about dipping in the Haroset. He says it should be there. Bishat Amira Tahagoda. It should be there when the Haggadah is recited. Why? Shahu Zecher Latit. It reminds us of the clay. Shinishtabdu Bayavasenabim Sayyim. Vizecher Latapuach. 
and it's a memory of the tapuach. And even more fascinatingly, I noticed later on when the Alter Rebbe talks about the idea of the charoset. So the Alter Rebbe says like this. He says the charoset, this is in, in, in subsection 32, Siflam and base. You have to make it thick. Why? Because it's a zecher latit. It doesn't mention anything about the apple. Our, our, our ancestors were, were, were slaves. They were working with that. You also have to, you to thin it with liquid. Zecher ladam, the memory of the blood. That's the Yerushalmi. It doesn't mention apple. And then he says, so you should make the charoset of the peyrot, of the fruits that the Jewish people are metaphorized as. And everybody says apples first, and the Alter Rebbe says figs first. Changes from the language of Teisvis, changes from the language of the Ramah, and he says te'enim, the Ramah doesn't bring the Pasuk, he brings the Pasuk. Then he says egozim, talks about nuts. Originally I thought maybe he was listing the Sheva, the Sheva Minim, the seven species, but egozim and I wanted the species. Then he says tomorrow, and then he says figs. And he brings the pasuk with the figs. Then he says pomegranates. He brings the pasuk with the pomegranates. And then he says the tapuchim, and he brings the pasuk with the tapuchim, and he adds six words. He adds the words that Rashi and Rashbam say, citing the Gemara in Mesechet Sota. Shahoyu yoldo chambenehem below etzev that they were having their babies in the apple orchards without any pain. In other words, the Alta Rebbe once again alludes to the apples, to the opinion of Levi. So it seems that the Alta Rebbe is basing himself on the, on the short version of the rush. And even though almost all of the other poskim say that it's about the mud, it seems very clear the Alta Rebbe says that there's an emphasis on the apples too. And the message of the apples too. And that's, that's how we have to learn the Gemara. So he's learning the Gemara like Rashi and Rashbam learned the Gemara. And this is something which is fascinating because in the Rebbe's Haggadah, when the Rebbe talks about the Haroset, the Rebbe makes a statement. He says, this is a Zecher Latit. It reminds us of the mud. Okay, that's like what all the other Rishonim are saying. And he says, we put something of tartness into it. Why? He says, Zecher Shaha Yushini Yisrael Kehois, because their teeth were set on edge, Mekoshi Hashibud, and he cites the Bach, explaining the Torah. That's the Bach. Then he says, You make it from the Perot, from which the Jewish people are metaphorized as. He cites the Chuvat Hagaonim of the Teisvis. The Rebbe says, Then there's this idea that you make it, you, you, you liquefy it, you make it thin with red wine, that's the Yerushalmi. He mentions the Machzer Vitri that we mentioned last week. That, so why is it called Charoset then? Charoset is like a paste. Charoset, he says, no, the Charoset is anything you dip in. The Machzer Vitri says, anything you dip is called Charoset. It's a name for a dip. And then the Rebbe does something fascinating. He quotes the pre Eitz Chaim. The pre Eitz Chaim, this is written by this, was, this specific part was written not by Rabbi Chaim Vital, who was the star pupil of the Arizal, but Rabbi, Rabbi Shmuel Vital, his son. They were Syrian Jews. They did not speak Yiddish. And he says that, that the simon for haroset can be taken from the Torah's description of those who worked with stone and wood. That it says, haroset even and haroshes eitz. The experts who were who are using, who are, who are um, chiseling the stone, the diamond cutters, and uh, those are the expert carpenters who are making the mishkan. And he says, Evan and Eitz is an acronym for the Yiddish words. Aleph stands for apple, or an apple. And it's fascinating because the Vitals didn't speak Yiddish, and neither did the Arizal, by the way. But nonetheless, they cite, they cite this, uh, the Lushan Ashkenaz. In the Germanic tongue, they say, Apple is Evan, Beis is Baren, pears, and Nun is Nissen, Nissen is nuts, Ingbar and Zimmerland. Ingbar and Zimmerland is ginger and cinnamon.
And then the Rebbe says, and in uh, Hebrew, citing the Eitz Chaim, he says, that means that we should make our, according to Kabbalah, we should make our charoset out of apples, pears, and uh, cinnamon, and nuts. And he says, however, the custom has developed not to use cinnamon and not to use ginger because we can't get it, which is kosher for Pesach. And then he says it's called charoses. Charoses is a zecher lilavena. It reminds us, which was maisa charsis. Charsis means like clay, pottery. And for this he cites the words of the Mordechai. The Mordechai is at the end of the Gemara Sachim. Now what's missing here in the Rebbe's comments? He doesn't mention anything about the apple. He doesn't mention, he mentions only the mud and he proves it. He says from Charoshes Eitz and Evan from the Priyetz Chaim. He says it's called Charsis, called Charoses from Charsis out of pottery and mentions nothing about the underneath the apple. And later on, when it comes to the eating of the Charoset, dipping of the Charoset, later on in the Rebbe's Haggadah, it says you add a little bit of wine and he says that why do you dip the charoset? Because of what we learned last week's class, because of the kapha, because of the germs, the bacteria. And he mentions nothing at all about the business of the apples. The Rebbe says, Ein mat bilim b'charoset, elam ishom mitzvah zeche letit. The reason that we dip in the charoset today, there's not really kapha, we don't have to worry about the bacteria anymore. The real reason we're doing it is zecher letit. And here he cites the Prichodosh, who says like the Bach, and he does not mention anything about the apples. And it's, uh, it's quite fascinating to me. Because basically, this makes a big difference in the story we tell. What, this is the talking part of the story. What is the things we have to talk about? The charosas is instructive in the story we have to tell. It depends how you learn this Gemara. If you learn the Gemara like Rashbam and Rashi, if you learn the Gemara like the Me'iri, we have to talk about the miraculous birth rate. If you learn the Gemara the way all the other Paschim learn the Gemara, if you learn the Gemara the way the Rosh seems to learn the Gemara, besides the kids are in the back, if you learn the Gemara the way the Rif learns it, if you learn the Gemara the way all the other Paschim, it's not about that story of birth rate. It's about the story of the bondage and the slavery, and later on, because we have to dip, that's why we add the wine, and that reminds us also of the beginning of the, of the plagues as well. And this is a, Alex, I could be wrong about this, but to me it was a huge thing to discover that the Alta Rebbe seems to rule a certain way, unusually, and the Rebbe overrides that. And the Rebbe cites the other sources and does not follow that. And the Rebbe says that Charoises, it's a story of the mud, it's a story of the clay, it's a story of the bricks. So that's the Gemara for you. Now we know how we learn the Gemara. You see how the Gemara, whether it follows the opinion, how we learn Abaye, you see if you read Abaye as, as trying to ratify both Levi and Rabbi Yechanan, or that Abaye is only following the opinion of Rabbi Yechanan, the tartness is either to remind us of the apple miracle or the birth rate, or the tartness is to remind us of the pain and suffering of that bondage and of that slavery. And that's uh, basically the story of the Charesis. So now you got part one. And I want to, before, you, before I leave you, I want to tell you that even though we learned here about it seems that the opinion li is like Rabbi Lazar Reb Tzaddik, it's not at all simple. It's not at all simple. And the Rambam clearly says that Allah is not like Rabbi Lazar Reb Tzaddik. And in Shulchan Aruch, very interestingly, it mentions when it talks about putting the Moror into the Charoset, it says that you should dip the moror in the charoset. Why? Because you have to make sure it's fully dipped in. And the commentary of the Tazmog and Dovin says, Mishum Kafa. So actually, it doesn't seem like the halacha is like a Belazabed Tzaddik. The first opinion is, it's only for health concerns. The second opinion is, it has spiritual significance. The pragmatic reality is, both are true. Both are true. Even though the Rebbe says, because in today's day and age we don't have the kafa, the emphasis is primarily on the concept of the zechel atit and not the kafa. Very interestingly, in the Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch, when he speaks about this in Simen Tofai and Hay, which is chapter 475 in, in Sif Yudalaf, the Alter Rebbe says, 
using the, the, almost the verbatim the words of Shulchan Aruch, he says, you put the Kezayis of Mara, you totally immerse it in the Charosas, in all the hummus, in order to kill off the Kafa, which we talked about in the last, the last episode. And he says that you have to make sure to shake it off, not to take away the taste of the Mara. And he says, even though in today's day and age, we don't have the Kafa anymore, we, we, um, we dip it anyway as a Zecher Letit, as a remembrance of the mud, the clay. And he says, nonetheless, we don't make a bracha on it, like, we, like I shared with you from the words of the Avu Darham, because it's a tofel amur, it's only a secondary. It's like the milk in this Cheerios. It's a secondary thing. Well, from the Alter Rebbe, it even seems that maybe we, he isn't, that, he, that it is a mitzvah, and maybe that in theory it would have to have a make a bracha, not like the Ramam says. But at any rate, the bottom line is this. There are two details in the haroset. One is that you dip it in the haroset. That's when you eat the mara. But the other more important detail of the haroset is it has to be on the table. It's not just about it being brought to the table. It has to be on the table. Through the, the, the magid part of seder, through the story. This is the talking point. This is a very vivid example of the mud. Later on we add the wine. But the main thing is to remember the tit, to remember the clay, to remember the backbreaking labor and the suffering of the Jewish people and uh, the business of the miraculous birth rate. Clearly, the Rebbe does not seem to follow that in his commentary. He focuses on the tit. And as I said, this is pragmatic because it's instructive not only as to how we make the concept of the haroset, but it's instructive of how we discuss the story of the Exodus on the night of the Seder. And that, my dear friends, is what I was able to glean from uh, learning this little piece of Gemara. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that. And of course, then we have, we have the memories recipe now. The main thing is to remember where we came from and the suffering we had. And to remember that despite it all, HaKadosh Baruch Hu redeemed us in the nick of time. And as we face very daunting challenges, it's important for us to remember what happened, to remember the realities of yesteryear, the dark and dismal challenges that our people faced, and that ultimately HaKadosh Baruch Hu saved us, and every generation they rise up against us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will save us, and hopefully this time around, it's with the act, the greatest act of salvation, the coming of Mashiach Tzidkenu, in our time, Bimheiro, Bimheiro, Amen. Thank you for joining here in person. Thank you for joining our line. If you aren't yet, please subscribe. If you haven't yet, please make sure you enable the notification. That's the little bell that dingles. So that way, maybe you'll find out that I'm giving a class in case you didn't know. And please share with others as well. Thank you. The Surah's Teves to be continued. So, let me turn this off.